Hey, this is Sean Wells. I'm a biochemist, dietitian, formulator. I own multiple companies, including Zone Halo Formulations and Ingenious Ingredients to help you formulate supplements, patent novel ingredients, scale your company and go to sale. And I'm here on this episode of the Jesse T Show. Sean Wells, welcome to the show, brother. Oh, thanks for having me on, Jesse. Yeah, my pleasure, man. I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation. Uh, a lot of what you do is a lot of what intrigues me uh, in terms of human optimization, uh, biohacking, as they call it. And so tell a little bit of the world about who you are and what you do. So I am a biochemist. I formulate supplements. I've formulated over 500 supplements. Uh, I've patented more than 15 ingredients, including tea cream and dynamine that are in about 700 products, energy ingredients, super popular. I've also uh, held patents on uh, the active isomer of ketones, dihydroberberine, which is an optimized form of berberine, um, new patents, new ingredients coming out, uh, a ingredient called dilucine that's about 40% better for muscle protein synthesis than leucine, which was always the gold standard, and a new energy ingredient that's coming out to the market this year that's really exciting. So uh, that's a lot of what I do. Um, that's the ingenious ingredient side. Um, and like I said, with Zone Halo formulations, I do formulate supplements, but also I've been working on uh, due diligence, acquisition readiness, uh, scaling and going to sale, working with companies typically in this five to $50 million range and helping them get ready, position them for sale. And I've done that with about 10 companies between me and my partner. We've helped them go to sale. Um, we have the attorneys, the investors, the um, bankers, private equities and strategics ready to roll. And we've done probably more than 20 decks between us. And uh, I was involved in a diamondized to post sale for 425 million. Uh, that's been a big part of the business now as well. Beautiful, brother. So, so how did you get into all this type of work? <laughs> um, it's an interesting story that I, I really, I was in, in bad health. Uh, I grew up bullied, abused. Um, and always trying to level up as the entrepreneur. It's seeking external validation. I'm never good enough. Um, grinding, you know, buying into the to the Gary B mindset of like hustle and grind, and I'm just gonna grind my way into success. Hustle till your eyes bleed. Yeah, and um, and then I'd get that external validation at some point, and then I would love myself. And um, I had been battling body dysmorphia with obesity, then anorexia, then orthorexia, uh, had, you know, numerous autoimmune issues. And I became passionate about supplements, nutrition. Uh, there was one point when I was in bed for six months and in pain, um, inflammation with Epstein-Barr virus, Hashimoto's, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, I thought my life was over and I ended up stumbling into the ketogenic diet. And that really helped me. This is over 20 years ago. That helped me fall into uh, the power of nutrition. And I had already loved supplements. I already been reading lots on supplements when I got into kind of my orthorexic phase uh, where I was doing protein and creatine and all those things. And so that's where the passion came from. And then I started working for uh, companies doing like marketing write-ups, going to the trade shows, Arnold, the Olympia, Supply Side West, like literally all my vacations, um, weekends, holidays were spent doing this stuff along this dream. And uh, I did get my master's in nutritional biochemistry at Chapel Hill, uh, became a dietitian. Um, and then the whole time I was a dietitian, I was just hustling to get on with these companies, um, doing all the work it took. I was like a message board moderator for a bunch of these message boards. I was helping do the write-ups, the scientific write-ups for these companies, 
Then I started doing formulations, but, you know, just getting free supplements for them. <laughs> and then, you know, eventually I got on. I, I got my, my dream job while I was working in hospitals and nursing homes as a dietitian, as a chief clinical dietitian. And um, I got called in to dimatize and they wanted uh, me to do a three-year exit and reformulate all their products. Uh, they were also um, a contract manufacturer as well. So we formulated supplements for GNC, Vitamin Shop, the Navy, um, Advocare, Smoothie King, as well as all of our products. And uh, I, I helped them go to sale and we had a successful sale. And then I worked with Biotrust as the CSO there, uh, helped them go from 10 million to 150 million. Uh, that company is going to sale soon uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, doing a lot of work there and uh, it's been exciting. And then now I'm just doing my own thing. Like I said, I've patented a slew of ingredients, um, helped conduct about 50 studies, a uh, best selling book called The Energy Formula All on Biohacking, uh, helped 10 companies go to sale. Uh, over 500 supplements formulated it's it's kind of insane like and, and I've done like five documentaries been on tv like 15 20 times like 300 podcasts like Ben Greenfield and uh, Primal Blueprint JJ Virgin like all these you know it, it's been it's been amazing I've been super blessed uh, I way exceeded whatever I thought I was going to do and uh, it's just been an exciting path it's a beautiful journey, brother. Number one, thank you for sharing and the courage to share some of those uh, darker spots, right? And, and, and I share a few of those things as, as a kid, uh, was bullied for years, um, got on that performance kind of pathway of, uh, you know, being recognized through different endeavors, whether it was sports or different, whatever it was. And, you know, through, through that trajectory, um, it led me to different places like entrepreneurship. And then, um, you know, I was on the Gary V bandwagon for a while too. And so, you know, like he's hustle porn, hustle till your eyes bleed. Like he's work, work, work until your face falls off. And then it's funny over the last couple of years, he's definitely gotten away from that. He's gotten away from that message as much. He's just like, do what you love. Yes. Rest is important. All this different stuff. And so his tunes changed a little bit. And I've since over the last couple of years, kind of gotten away from following all of his content. I think he's a, ahead of his time. I think he's great, but um, what he's tapping into, what he's realizing is that it's not sustainable to, to be able to work 80, 90, hundred hours a week grind, 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 grind for the long term. And there's actually studies that you probably are aware of that have come out that it's, it's, it's really bad for mental health. It's bad for, you know, living long, a long, vibrant life. Um, and I want to get into some of these other biohackers later that you mentioned, like Ben Greenfield. And if you know, Paul Check and Aubrey Marcus, some of these other people, but um, I want to talk about the mental health aspect before we really dive deep into the biohacking. So a lot of what you said plays into emotional trauma, um, you know, mental abuse in a sense, you know, being abused, being bullied, uh, being on his performance, you know, and then you going through your own physical of anorexia and, and uh, you know, all these different things that you, so how did you work your mind and, and, and heal yourself to get to a place of wholeness? Like what were some of the things that you were doing along chasing this passive path of entrepreneurship to heal yourself? You know, I would love to say that I had the shift years and years ago but it really was just before COVID that like January, New Year's um, 2020, that I did a plant medicine journey and that shifted everything for me. Uh, it really shifted everything. That's where I was in this, uh, it was psilocybin, uh, MDA, and I was in it. And I had never given anyone in this room, there was about 20 of us, uh, my resume, you know, normally it's like dick measuring stuff. And it's like, you know, here's my resume. Here's why I'm awesome, especially when you're at masterminds. And this was a mastermind event. It was kind of like a pre mastermind event. And um, instead, I was just laying there amongst strangers in a cuddle puddle. Yes, that's what I needed. Um, I really needed that at that point because I, I honestly, I'd never loved anyone because I'd never loved myself. Oh I, I had gone 40 plus years without loving anyone or loving myself. 
I gave a lot. I was very much a giver. Uh, I cared for people. I mean, I worked in nursing homes and hospitals for 10 years, giving all the time. And I was always giving my advice on supplements and, and helping people. But I, I had that external validation thing where I wanted the words of affirmation, where I wanted the, the social proof and uh, to eventually love myself. But I always felt like I never gave myself that. It always was like on to the next level. Okay, I did this on to the next level. You know, it's like you get on Ben Greenfield, then you have to get on Joe Rogan. Like you get on, you know, local TV, you have to get on national TV. You get on national TV, you got to get on the Today Show. It's like you get like a $500,000 house, you need a $1 million house. It's like, it's, it's like this mindset that never ends. Yep. And you keep trying to prove yourself and level up. And for me, when I was getting loved and giving love, without any of my resume, just for being Sean, just for laying there and having a smile on my face, it shifted my heart. And I realized that I can be loved and I can just give love freely. And it's that easy. It's there's like all the stuff I was trying to do, all these things I was trying to earn, the hundreds of thousands of dollars I was spending on you know, building out my programs and social media and, and traveling. And literally I was traveling 300 days a year to be at conferences and masterminds and, and leveling up. Yep. Yep. And I was like, I can just have love. I don't have to pay for it, earn it, grind for it, eventually get it someday. I mean, it sounds so simple, but until your heart feels it, yes, it's not real. Someone can tell you this stuff. Like, it's kind of like telling someone, hey, you need to eat right and exercise more. <laughs> okay, I got it. But does 90% of the population, you know, 88% of the population is metabolically dysfunctional. So clearly there's something wrong with just telling someone that yes. thing. Yes. Once you feel it, everything shifts. And then for me, the other big epiphany, uh, while I was like staring at the ceiling for like six hours after everyone fell asleep, because for me, it was my first journey. My mind was just blown. Oh, yeah. And I was just like, oh, my God, like I could just I, I had this realization I could just dress up like a rodeo clown and travel the Himalayas. Like literally, like I could just do Which whatever would be amazing. The fuck <laughs> I want to do like like because that that hustle and grind mentality, I was told like. If you work more hours, you'll get there faster. If you put your head down, you'll get there faster. But where is there? Yep. Like I was like, I just wanted to get there as fast as possible. It's like when you're like speeding in your car and you don't even like need to get anywhere. Like it's just, you're just speeding to get there. But where are you speeding to? Like you're not appreciating the yes. journey. Yes. And so I just had this epiphany of like, wait, I can... I can just take a left turn or a right turn anywhere here and just chase what lights me up. I don't have to put my head down and go as quickly as possible to wherever. And I don't have to be what I set out to be. I can just be whatever lights me up that day. I can go chase that thing. And that makes me more unique. And no one can compete with me when I'm chasing all these things that light me up. Yep. So a lot's going on there. First and foremost, you're, you're a soul brother without even knowing it, man, because I've been on my plant medicine journey for a couple of years now, and it's profoundly changed my life. And you and I didn't know this coming into this conversation. Like we didn't talk about this stuff, but it's funny how people align. And my very first plant medicine ceremony was, was with psilocybin mushrooms. And yeah. my first intention, I had three, my first intention was to be and receive more love in the world. It's literally what you're talking about. It's like, if you had to be able to love yourself first, and this yeah. is what happened with me, man. So I went deep and had a really hard, tough journey. Because at the time for the 37 years I was alive, I hadn't loved myself truly because of all the shit that I had been given from a junkie dad to being bullied to, you know, doing drugs a couple of years for myself. Like I had a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and I wasn't really dealing with any of the trauma and loving myself. And it opened, it cracked me wide open. And I was in this state of just loneliness and sadness. And then I started paying attention to the things and, and different insights started coming to me. And by the end of that journey, I, I was able to start loving myself. And it took me a while, but it, it, it was able to come to fruition. And it took about two weeks of a really deep despair and sadness from that journey. 
where I was crying at everything, but I was learning how to be emotional and, and recognize emotions and name them and feel them. And not just like every other dude, just be- bury them down. Like we, we were all taught and a beautiful thing happened where two weeks later, like a light bulb just went on. And like, I was just in this state of being and presence and happiness. And I learned from that moment that I wasn't loving myself. And so I set out on this journey for two years after that until current day on loving myself, showing up for myself so that I could do those things for other people. And it's incredible because these are nature's medicines. These are nature's supplements. Like psilocybin mushrooms is unaltered and entheogenic, beautiful tool, I believe, given to us from whatever version of God someone believes in so that we can heal ourselves and heal other people. So I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper on that before we jump to all the other things. There's so many things I want to talk about at this point, but what was, what were some of the integrations for you after that journey? Like what was some of the insights and how are you starting to operate differently in the world? Was it, was it just, you know, being more present, being happier? Like, where were you? Well, first off, I did probably about 20 more journeys with this one couple out of Austin. Hell yeah. Uh, all during COVID. Um, I started exploring that. And while people were in fear of, you know, the, the virus and Black Lives Matter and rioting and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Trump versus Biden and, and angry and divided and, and hostile and, you know, uh, gay, anti-gay, you know, gun rights, abortion. Like I was in these groups where people were deciding to go deeper in their marriage, where they were thinking about becoming poly, where they're coming trans, where they were uh, stepping out and being gay, where they were, uh, you know, deciding to get divorced, but in a loving way, yes. you know, leaving that job that they've been at, um, you know, finding a whole new career. Like I was like witnessing people make massive shifts and loving people of all types. And I was just getting like these cuddle puddles and hugs and, (laughs) you know, that were just like, while everyone else was fearful, I proceeded for the last 18 months to just go deep and learn about myself and love others in a whole new way that I never have. And I've always had eclectic friends from my world travels and masterminds and all these things. But to some degree, it is like, you know, dick measuring, like we talked about in that professional environment. Um, But when you're in this environment and you're cracked open, I mean, literally in one weekend event, you're closer to these people than you've had in your life, your entire life. No question. I call that intimacy, like real intimacy is when you're seen in a truly vulnerable state and you see someone back in that vulnerable state. Yes. That's intimacy. And you share that. Yep. And someone is like, you know what? Like, I think I'm going to have an operation and become, you know, trans or, you know, like, I think I'm going to get that divorce or I think I'm like, you know, I want to be poly. Like, I just want to be poly and explore like whatever, like I'm going to change my name because this name feels attached to abuse or whatever. Like people are just stepping in yes, and like living their truth. And, and you know what, just like uh, we were saying before, it doesn't have to be like one thing. It doesn't like part of it's just committing to you and exploring to try and figure out who you are and what lights you up. And granting yourself grace that there are no mistakes, that it's just a path to explore and you're not going to be right or wrong. You just need to explore who you are and what lights you up. And that's, and that's the beauty of it is, is, you know, some people are like, you know, I think I want to like try out cross-dressing and and see if that works for me or, you know, whatever. And like, then maybe it doesn't like, and they're like, you know what, like now they're like, now that they've crossed that off the list, they're like, cool. Like, and, and it's just beautiful to witness and, and uh, to see people just live their truth in whatever that looks like in that moment. Yes. Unbelievable, brother. Yeah, man. I, uh, same vein as you, man. I, I dove deeper into love and, and being a curious explorer and, and, and having these shared experiences over the last 18 months when, you know, pretty much the pandemic has been rolled out. And so um, I've gone to Peru and done ayahuasca and San Pedro and Combo. And um, I'm, I'm doing that in October. I'm going yeah. to Peru. 
Machu Picchu, doing the ruins. I'm yes. doing ayahuasca for the first time. So beautiful, brother. I'm I can't excited. wait to hear about your journey. Um, so profound, man. It was uh I got I got to sit with uh I have I have two sons, but I have uh my I got divorced as well, but we did it in a very beautiful, loving way. And a lot of it was through this type of work. So it's funny how you're saying that, but we had two losses prior. So we had a seven day old daughter that passed away and then we had a miscarriage and then we had our two sons. And so one of my intentions going into Peru back in March was to sit with my seven day old daughter. And while sitting with San Pedro, which is like the flip side to ayahuasca. I'm doing that as well. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell, are you going to another planet, Peru? I don't know. I'm doing this with Tom Cole Whitty out of Austin okay. and they have 10th generation ayahuasca arrows that'll be there. And I'm so, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it could be. Uh, and, and, and anyway, so I sat with my, one of my intentions was to, to be with my daughter in, on San Pedro. Uh, I sat with her for almost two hours, her energy, her spirit. And it, it taught me that the pe the losses that I've had in my life, um, the people that I love the most, like my mom, my dad, my daughter that have all passed away over the years, they don't leave you. They're always with you energetically and spiritually. And so I was searching to be with her. And then I realized after that journey that she was, she had never gone anywhere, which was so powerful. Um, but I bring up these, these, these stories because it's, it's a shared journey that we have. And then since then I've through the, through the pandemic, I've traveled a ton, been to Mexico a couple of times, uh, just, ca just came back from Tulum and a, tr uh, a voyage through Chichen Itza to, to the pyramids. And, and we worked with DMT, which was an amazing. So like just on the same type of journey, man, and all it's done, man, is it's just taught me how to be in receive the whole message for me, that very first intention to be and receive love you know, almost two years ago, up until two weeks ago, when I was sat with DMT, the, the message was the same. It was like, love is the answer. And it's, it's, it's so cliche. It's so like, cause, cause my question going in, my intention going into this journey was I asked, um, I don't know if he's technically a shaman. His name's Ezra. He's unbelievable. He's worked with like, uh, Tyson on his DMT journey, Joe Rogan on his DMT journeys down in, in Mexico. He's the guy that's like helping facilitate those. Um, I said, is there any intention too big? He's like, no, I said, my intention is to heal the world because I have been called to take these experiences that I've had and like share them with other people. And I've done retreats and different things like this. And so by the end of that journey, it was like, the answer is love, no matter what you do. And, and, and it was, it was what a question I had was, was it my ego partly saying like, I want to heal the world or was it like coming from a place of love and, and each interaction, each moment that I have with people. I can share love and receive love. And then just compounding that and bringing that out to multiple people through as, as my journey, you know, transpires was kind of part of the answer. So it's always come back to that whole love piece. Everything is love. And, and it's funny because you start looking at things differently. Like the Beatles, all we need is love. Like before listening to that song back in the day, you would have no, like now it's like, that's the answer. Love is the answer. And so it's like, love everything you do, like love your path, love your journey, love your business, love your friends, like love, love everything you do. And that kind of bleeds out into everything that we do. So it's interesting. We're kind of doing some of the same things. For sure. And, and I love the, like what, what you're saying about like why you're doing it. Uh, I had a friend recently tell me that he wanted to get on Joe Rogan. And um, I was actually signed up to do to do Joe Rogan and, and it got canceled because of COVID and, and changing over to Spotify. And mm. and um, and he's like, oh, I need to get on Joe Rogan. And I was like, well, why do you want to get on Joe Rogan? He's like, well, it's huge. Like, I, I need to get on there. And I was like, well, do you care about the value you're providing Joe Rogan? Right. Do you care about the platform and the and the people that you'll be impacting? Like what why is it? It just sounds like to me like you just need to do it for ego reasons. But do you really want to get on Joe Rogan and just be on there for ego reasons? Or do you want to be on there and use that platform to make massive impact? Yes. Yep. And and make a massive impact for him and provide value for him. Like he's put in a lot of work, like recognize that, like the reason that you want to get on there is because he's made massive impact. Yep. So yeah, that, it's, it's a, uh, it's a great discussion to have. Unbelievable brother. Well, let, let's dive back into, you know, your, your expertise and, and, you know, for me, my journey is, is becoming more in tune with my body as the years go by and realizing how important this, I joke around, call it a meat soup, but this vessel is, is guiding our spirit through this journey. And so 
there's a lot that goes into being healthy, especially as an entrepreneur. It's a lot easier to be a healthy entrepreneur than it is to be a sickly one because you need a lot of energy. You need a lot of mental fortitude. And as soon as your energy starts to dip, your mindset and your mentality starts to weaken. And so it's really, if your body's strong and your mentality's strong, you'll operate strongly in different endeavors. And so that's how I, I, I personally see it. And so what I learned through, through years of listening to Ben Greenfield and Paul Check and Aubrey Marcus is, you know, um, health starts in the gut, starts with nutrition. It's like what you're putting into your body. What are you putting into your body? The th- the, obviously, there's different things like energy you're taking from people and different, different things that play into health, you know, genetics and so forth, depending on how much you believe in that. But um, really what you're putting, consuming, at least nutritionally, is a huge part of your health. Like you can work out seven days a week. But if you're even eating foods that are causing you to be inflamed, or if you're eating foods that are, you know, too sugary, whatever it is, <clears throat> it's going to kill you. So paying attention to that and having like different things, like I've done Viome through the years and kind of seeing what foods are good for me and what, you know, probiotics I have and don't have and what I need. Can we expand and kind of get a little bit nerdy when it comes to those things? Because I'm really interested to hear your take on it, your, your expertise and what your thoughts are and really optimizing nutrition and health and wellness overall. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, And that's something that I talk about in my book, The Energy Formula. That's the, it's actually an acronym for experiment, nutrition, exercise, routines, growth, and your tribe. And so the the second chapter is nutrition. I get into, and each chapter has a a formulator's corner that has supplements that, you know, revolve around, let's say growth for mindset, like nootropics or, you know, in nutrition, I get into like polyphenols and, and some of these cool supplements. Um, for me, I do a paleo diet with intermittent fasting and I do a cyclical and targeted ketogenic diet. So, um, I ascribe to metabolic flexibility. I'm not anti-carb. I am someone that, um, just put on weight easily. I think, uh, you know, just given my background that I'd talked about, um, easily, can fall into like insulin resistance and and metabolic dysfunction. So for me, like being metabolically flexible, the ketogenic diet helps regularly exercising helps like doing high intensity interval training. Um, Those are some of the things that I do as far as there's certainly like you're talking about the gut brain axis is significant. There's more neurotransmitters in your gut than is in your brain. Um, We've seen not only leaky gut being issue with these tight junctions not being tight enough and these food particles that are inflammatory getting directly into the bloodstream. But we also see that there's leaky brain. And it's really wow. interesting that this gut brain axis is so massive. And we are seeing depression, anxiety, uh, suicidal thoughts, Parkinson's, you know, some of these things reversed in the gut. Um, really fascinating data um, with FMTs, fecal microbiota transplants, where, um, you know, it started with animal models, like mouse models, where they do uh, feces transfer from like a healthy mouse to a, an unhealthy mouse. And then they have a radical shift in health. Wow. And again, this goes back to bacteria. We're more bacteria than we are cells. Um, Sometimes it's as much as like 10x a difference. So we think about ourselves as cells, but we are more bacteria. And this is one of the reasons that wherever someone stands on, you know, the virus and how they want to deal with that, with with this pandemic, I believe that it's important to take your immune system to the gym. No question. And it's important to not isolate, to not avoid sunshine fresh air, vitamin D, resiliency though, resiliency is important. So getting in the dirt, touching pets, hugging people, eating food off the floor, touching doorknobs, not having fear about it. Fear lowers your immune system more than 50%. Wow. But you need that. Like, like I travel a lot too. I'm getting exposed to all these different microbiomes, like from different people. And if people are coughing and sneezing, I'm not running from it. Here's, here's the caveat though. I'm not crazy. I'm not like blanket anything. I'm a scientist. Here's where if I was immunocompromised, if I was tired, if I was feeling a little under the weather, if I had a low grade fever, if I was feeling inflamed, I wouldn't do that. This is just like checking your HRV before you go to the gym. 
You know, if your HRV is off, maybe you just walk on the treadmill, maybe you take today off, whatever it is. But if you're good, train all out. And that's how I look at my immune system. It's like, if I'm good, I need to challenge it to get stronger. This is the idea in biohacking and biochemistry called hormesis. Yep. You need to challenge to adapt and grow stronger. The obstacle is the way, like uh, Ryan Holiday talks about. Oh, yeah. Not only is that a stoic mental mindset for growth, it's how your body operates. You need to challenge it in the right way. And there's, uh, if, you, if you imagine a bell curve, this is in my book, <clears throat> that on the left-hand side of the bell curve is this idea of U-stress, E-U-stress, meaning positive stress. Yep. In the middle, right down the, the meat of the bell curve is the Goldilocks zone, meaning this is the ideal amount of stress to bring about the ideal amount of adaptation. And then on the right-hand side where the bell curve is going down is distress, where now your stress is getting too much and it's counterproductive. Here's the thing to know, which is what I was talking about, why you should use HRV or how you're feeling or whatever. Things that can be used stresses like cold plunges, red light saunas, intermittent fasting, the ketogenic diet, uh, working out in the gym, all of these things can be amazing you stresses. But if I had just gone through a divorce, if I just lost my job, if I was sick with COVID, if whatever, now they're not. Now they're distresses. And this is where you need to, you know, be mindful of something isn't good all the time. This is why I really, I get frustrated with a lot of the blanket advice that's getting thrown around. Yeah, It's no longer science. No. People that espouse science, it feels more like religion. Yeah. It feels more like zealotry because science never gives you, anyone who says scientific fact or scientific proof is a marketer. There's no such thing in science. Any good study ends with, in this particular situation with these particular people yes. and these particular averages, we saw these particular outcomes in our particular model, but we need to do more studies to find out more. All data ever is, is directional. There's no perfect study in 8 billion people. And as much as people, I've done a lot of animal work, as much as people uh, talk about, oh, it needs to be human study to be legit. There's no lifetime models of humans. Uh, you can't control nearly as many factors like diet, like environment, uh, like you can with animals. And with animals, you can control their genetics so that they're all genetically the same. Yep. So I get frustrated when some people are like, oh, it's not human data, so it's useless. And I'm like, in some cases, the animal data is better. Like, really, no joke. So uh, those are some of the things that I think are important. And then also there's this idea of the stress bucket in your body. And the bigger your stress bucket, it's called allostatic load. And the bigger your allostatic load, the stress bucket is, the more capacity you have for stress. The more that you can have all these things come into your life and still have room for you stresses but if your bucket is small then you're fragile you're easier to kill yep not anti-fragile like we're thermically controlled all day every day what do you think this does this is going to shrink our bucket this is going to make us more fragile more easy to kill we're no longer as resilient because we're at 68 degrees to 72 degrees all day every day everywhere we go we're not being exposed to very cold temperatures, like doing cold plunges or yeah. just being outside, right? And we're not being exposed to extreme heat like we used to. Oh, it's uncomfortable. Like, you know, like just turn on the air conditioning. And so, you know, that's why we're less resilient. Yeah. And that's why like biohacking is like trying to, you know, just like we're doing lifting weights at the gym to simulate how manually active we used to be. You know, some of these biohacks are doing that too. We're fasting more because it's not realistic that we're eating eight times a day. You know, food used to be hard to find. 
Yeah. They, they didn't call it fasting. They used to call it starving. Living. Yeah. That's just how they survived. <laughs> How, how do you look at uh, fasting? That's a good, that's a good topic because it plays into so many different things. Uh, I, I've been, I've been fasting for about two years, pretty much daily and it, it changes. And I'm like you, I don't like, if I get hungry in the morning, I eat, but for the most part, I'm, I'm on like a, a 16, eight or like a, like an 18, six on average, or like, but I'm not, I'm not even calculating it. Cause it's just when I decide to eat. Right. And so, but again, I'm not married to the idea. If I want to eat out of that window, I eat, but you know, 90% of the time I'm always kind of doing the fasting and I've seen so many personally, so many great results from it. And then there's times where I might take a few days off and just say, I'll eat what I want. I'll eat what I want. And just kind of kind of get back to that stasis of, you know, maybe like I was getting uh, bored or is getting tired of it, but it's just become a lifestyle. It's become a, I don't have to think about it. And it's, it fits what I do. I'm not hungry when I wake up first thing in the morning, I like to train in the morning where I'm on an empty stomach. And I, I find that it gives me a lot more energy. Like when I'm, when I'm not digesting and I have time to kind of talk about some of the health benefits that you've seen either personally or through some of these other uh, cases from fasting and talk about maybe some of the tips and tools uh, for people that are listening that maybe want to start or uh, enhance or whatever when it comes to fasting. Yeah. Fasting is going to lower chronically elevated insulin. Uh, that advice we were given to eat like you know, six to eight meals a day was insane. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's literally the opposite of what you want to do. This idea of grazing all day long, um, that we want to have periods where to your point where we're not digesting stuff. And during those periods, we go through cellular autophagy where there's detoxing. It's like a vacuum cleaner going through your cell. And even better is something called mitophagy, where it's cleaning up the mitochondria. And mitochondrial dysfunction leads to pretty much all disease and cellular aging. So I would say about 99% of diseases are non-inborn genetic diseases. They're metabolic diseases. Wow. And we see that with can uh, cancer, Alzheimer's. Parkinson's, coronary heart disease, they're metabolic diseases. They're based on our diet, based on insulin resistance largely, and based on mitochondrial dysfunction. And the same is true with biological versus chronological aging. We're aging faster with, uh, with this insulin resistance, which leads to glycation, which is blood sugar damage, which leads to oxidation, inflammation, shorter telomeres, DNA methylation errors, all this kind of stuff. So this is where having reduced insulin allows for higher growth hormone, higher autophagy, your body to rest and reset, and these tissues to be able to repair um, when you're not digesting or assimilating or you know moving these nutrients through your body you can be in a in a state of repair and that's what autophagy is so just think about you know how much these tissues are turning over i mean they're not going to be turning over as well if they're in use at that exact time yeah. so that's the idea is that you know fasting is allowing for your body to have, like to rest and repair uh, just like when you go to sleep your, your brain goes through that phase you need this time of not snacking, not eating, especially high glycemic foods, especially inflammatory uh, seed oils and, and vegetable oils. And, you know, getting in healthy food and using the intermittent fasting windows. Um, I like doing exactly what you're saying, like an 18 and six or 16 and eight. Um, it's, it's easier to, it's hard to fit all the calories into like a four hour window or, or some of these one meal a day things. I feel like those can work. Um, if you are like kind of a power eater or, you know, if you're looking to lose weight, but I feel like it's hard to maintain those for, for a long period of time. Like, yep. I feel like for most people, they won't be eating enough calories. Um, so it's just not ideal long-term. And literally when you chronically under eat your organs, especially your brain will atrophy. Yep. It, it's just gonna, I, I liken it to the idea of like your phone going into like power saver mode, you know, like where, you know, it reduces the amount of colors and like it can't do all the things in the background. And it's like, 
that's just trying to save the battery as best yeah. they can. That's yep. what's happening when you chronically under eat calories. So that's not ideal. Nope. It, what is ideal is you know doing this um, this intermittent fasting with healthy food and exercise, and that insulin resistance is going to be remedied and become insulin sensitivity. You're going to have higher growth hormone. You'll have a higher metabolic rate, especially if you're doing things like cold plunges and red light saunas, you're elevating something called like heat shock proteins with these red light saunas, you're lowering inflammation. And with cold plunges, you're imp improving brown adipose tissue, um, which it's brown because of it's mitochondrial dense. And this could be like one of the biggest reasons, like some people that can eat as much as they want. And you're like, how do they eat all this stuff and stay lean? It could be brown adipose tissue. That seems to be like one of the, the biggest factors in that. And certainly they have high insulin sensitivity and fasting is going to help that. What I do like, and I tell people that I think is important is Dr. Sachin Panda's data around circadian rhythm I like an eating window uh, to be during the daylight hours because yeah. I feel like that's what our body is adapted for. It's not realistic to be eating when it's dark and that's affecting your circadian rhythm and how well you're going to sleep and the hormones and neurotransmitters and the way that they're released. So it's ideal that we are eating during that daylight window. And so I actually do more of like that 16 and eight in the summer even sometimes like, um, you know, a 14 and 10 in the summer. Mm -hmm. And then in the winter, it gets really short to more like a six hour window because just daylight changes. Yep. And then I, you know, pack in more calories and more meals like during the, you know, winter. And, and it's like a little, a little lighter, maybe a little bit more plant-based in the, in the, in the summer. And I just, it, it just feels like it makes sense uh, in terms of adaptation and evolution. The, th the theory that it's coming out is, is following the sun and, and it's kind of going back to our ancestral roots, right? And, and yeah. you know, ben, ben talks about this a lot, like having one foot in the ancestral, one foot in today in terms of like how, how to live your life through biohacking. And there's another guy that came to mind. I don't know if you've heard of uh, the certified health nut, Troy Casey. He's, uh, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, he's a little out there. He's, uh, but he's great. And he's, he's what he needs to be. But he talks about following the sun as well in terms of your eating habits. I mean, when, when the sun's up until the sun's down and following that helps with circadian rhythm, because the biggest biohacks of all time for most people that just want like just to kind of get into it is sleep moving your body and nutrition. If you can really do well with those three things, you know, you're getting enough sunlight and all this like kind of natural stuff, you're grounding and you're getting outside and you're moving around. Like you can really have a really healthy life just with those three things. But most people fall short on those because a lot of times they'll focus on training really hard, but they don't get enough sleep or uh, they're not eating right, but they're training an hour or two a day. So they're kind of, they're, they're lopsided with where their perspectives are. But the way I heard it uh, said was, you know, if you're if you're screwing up in sleep, which is pretty much the mother of all of these biohacks, at least from what I've kind of seen, you're, you're stepping over dollars to pick up pennies. You're really not paying attention to the body's healing process. And so um, I think this is kind of a core thing. It goes back to ancestral roots, like follow the sun and get enough sleep every night, whatever that amount. It's different for everyone, but get consistent sleep and, and make sure you're not setting yourself up for failure with sugar right before you go to bed or alcohol right before you go to bed, which is a good question I want to ask you. So talk about alcohol because uh, oh, I, oh, yeah, just, go ahead, go ahead. Just, just one sec. Cause like I was just at a mastermind with JJ version uh, it's a healthcare practitioner mastermind. We did this passion test and sleep was one of the top things that like came up for me as like being most important to my health, like you said, and I've struggled at a lot of points with sleep mm -hmm. and I've met people that are the most brilliant biohackers, the most brilliant physicians, the most brilliant people in healthcare and they struggle with sleep. And, yeah. and I've been one of them most of my life. So I've made that a priority to figure that out. And what have you found? Well, I, I was going to say that the, the one thing going back to our original part of our discussion that I might actually put above sleep is one self love, but two, I think the ultimate form of self love, my number one on this passion test was being in integrity with my higher self. Love it. Yeah. And that was the most important thing. If I was going to, I ranked, like I had about 20 passions 
and that was it. And then we waited them out and like, okay, is this one more important than that one? And, you know, it takes about an hour to go through all this, like, which one's more important than this one? And that was my number one because it just outranked everything. If I'm chasing what lights me up yes, every day and I'm putting boundaries around the things that do not and so speaking powerful. my truth, speaking my truth, so important. I think so many people don't realize one of the ultimate forms of self-love is saying no. Yes. And saying, I don't want that. I don't like that. I am speaking up. You can hear my voice. Like I've done so many events that just revolve around you yelling things out or <laughs> speaking your truth for the first time or like just blurting and, and being and, you know, cause we've suppressed and suppressed and suppressed and suppressed. Yes. And so your body doesn't even trust you anymore. You say all these things, but then you don't do it. So your body doesn't even <laughs> right. believe. Keeping commitments to yourself, right? How can so, you keep anyone else? Yeah. When, when you say like, uh, you know, I'm going to go work out and you don't go work out like your body, you know, knows the body isn't changing like it should. The body isn't priming things like it should, because you say things all the time, but don't follow through with them. Right. So that's been a, that's been a, a game changer for me is to just acknowledge, uh, living in my truth, you know, acknowledging higher self. Um, but sleep is certainly up there and, and self-love is, is a piece of that, uh, higher truth, higher self. So. I love that. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're talking to someone who preaches that like day and night self-love and, 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 you know, we talked about a little while ago, love is the answer. Like that's been my whole journey with plant medicines is, is bringing me more into that just embodiment of love everywhere I go, that light. And, uh, so I love what you're saying there. And it's true. I mean, it even, it even kind of harkens to like blue zones around the world and the studies they've done with the blue zones of why people are the most centurions in these areas. And it's a lot of times there's different factors, but really it comes down to community and happiness. And, and, and that all entails love. So it's like dancing and singing and arts and having relationships that are meaningful. These are some of the, the other biohacks that people don't look at that are more kind of the softer sciences that are just yeah, as, yeah yeah literally the the back part of my book like when i get into growth it's like the the stoic mindset the obstacles the way kind of stuff and then the last chapter is your tribe and it's all about community and connection and blue zones and oh my goodness. and all that and that's the number one predictor of longevity according to the harvard study the the longest running study out there that's over 80 years running now is quality of relationships more yeah. than, you know, blood work, genetics, um, economic status, marriage status, number of, you know, whatever, like a diet type and any of that stuff is quality of relationships. No question. It's the number one predictor. So yes, I've spent a lot of time in Sardinia. Mm. I'm actually looking to move to Nosara, Costa Rica. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm oh, all yeah. about the blue zones and, and they do, they, they slow down. Yep. There's, there's a bending of time there. It doesn't feel as rushed. You know, there isn't a cell phone out on the table. It's, you know, it's connecting at meals for three plus hours. And how do they do that? Cause they do like one small, small meal and then one big meal and that's it. Yep. That's all they do is two meals. And that big meal is all about the community and connection and they have purpose. They start with their why they have passion yes. in their lives, And it doesn't have to be like a million influencers or a million followers, sorry. And being on Joe Rogan, it's like, they're just passionate about their family and whatever they're doing that day. Like they love what they do. And that's, yeah, exactly. So blue zones, community connection, start with your why, living your passion, 100%. I, lo I love how um, the drumbeat is getting louder over mm -hmm. the years of just consciousness being raised and awareness and people being awakened and all these things that like we've never met before. We were talking through different channels until we just connected for the first time today. And we have a shit ton in common things that we're all into. And it's like, a lot of it's pointing towards just a better holistic life on earth. A lot of it's just taking, putting the noise aside and putting uh, what the T, what I haven't had cable TV in years, but putting what the TV tells you and putting what like the, the talking heads tell you and say, do this chase. It's like, no, you have to step into what your truth is, what you believe in and how you're going to show up in the world and deploy that love in everything that you do. And it just everything kind of, it, it's almost like it becomes synchronicity, but it's just because you're changing your habits. 
Um, and I just want to talk about one of the other biohacks that, that I've gotten into is uh, ecstatic dance. And so um, mm -hmm. I did I, that I, last I, night. I, what's that? I did that last night. I did too for two hours. Shut up. I did from five to 7 p.m. in Atlanta at Canva Park, man. And it was fucking beautiful. It was like a bunch of like just high functioning hippies just getting after it, man. And it was like, you know, 90 degrees, everybody's sweating their balls off. And like, it's just, it was primal. It was beautiful. I went through different states of, of different feelings, emotions, and it's really just dancing by yourself and a group of people dancing by themselves. It's like the coolest thing. So, so tell me about your experience with ecstatic dance. Uh, well, it's with this guy, um, Pavel, uh, who is known as Noah Aon, N-O-A-A-O-N, on uh, Instagram. He works with this group Frequency here in Austin, but he's a worldwide DJ, Wim Hof, oh, yeah. uh, breathing expert, and he's worked directly with Wim Hof a bunch. He's like done like you know massive festivals in Atlanta, in in Ibiza, like all over the world. Oh yeah, and he also is huge into into dance and biohacking. So he does all the biohacking uh, festivals and events as well. Uh, amazing guy, and we just had this group uh, here in Austin last night, and we did uh, we did exactly that. We did some yoga, then we did some breath work with the masks on, but he has the headphones on, you know, so it's silent kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and so we're just going in and then, you know, we're doing the breath work and then we get up and dance and we were like, what was cool is like, we were kept the, uh, the headphones on and the blindfolds on. So we were kind of bumping into each other and he was like encouraging us to like, that's okay. Like, yeah. you know, and he was saying, hug each other. And like, so I was just ended up like hugging all these you know men women whatever of all sizes and like while we're dancing around and we're even like twirling each other but like with blindfolds on so you don't even know who it is that's beautiful and um and there was a beauty to that because we're so conditioned to whenever we you know run into someone it's oh excuse me sorry excuse me and in this case it was like serendipitous yeah oh, yeah you know, and it, and it, and then we got into like, he keeps building you up kind of like a DJ likes to do, you know, from, from very chill, like, you know, breath work and, and tribal stuff. But then we, you know, we're standing up, we're dancing around. It's like a little bit more trancey. And then it's like, you know, getting into more like drop kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and getting just, like very euphoric and, and, uh, and it's just fun. And then, you know, every now and then he's like, now scream as loud as you want, yeah. like, let it go. like you were just talking about, like, stop suppressing. And, yes. you know, people were crying, people were having breakthroughs, like, cause we we're just holding so much of that stuff in. Mm. So powerful. They're, like I'm getting chills right now talking about it. Cause my experience is very similar. And, you know, the, the guy, uh, Scott Houston is very powerful with what he does, uh, running his ecstatic dance and just a beautiful container. And he's just, at one point he was like, this is ecstatic dance, get ecstatic. And like, everybody's like, you know, getting into it and just, then he goes through the different lows and the highs. And like, it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful journey, man. And it was so powerful. I had so much energy. I actually had, um, when I do plant medicines, I get into, uh, what, one of my best friends, his name is Lane. He's an amazing human being. I'll plug you into him for so many reasons. But uh, whenever we do plant medicines together and go on drinks together, like there's this uh, creator state that comes comes along. And there's this, this energy that emits from my hands and I can feel it. It's powerful. It's like when you do breath work and your hands get charged up. Yeah. I get that state for different reasons uh, when I'm on plant medicines. But I got it last night while I was doing the energetic dance. And I was with a friend and I was like, you got to feel this. And it was like, so <laughs> No, I, I, I felt that last night. Like uh, we actually, like after we did the breath work, like we were still laying there on our mats with the blindfolds, with the headphones, but like there was, you know, mats in circle, like yeah. all around the room. And so I ended up holding a, a person's hands on either side and my hands were literally just vibrating. Yes, It was crazy to feel how much energy was, was moving through them after we did you know, Wim Hof and holotropic, like he oh, goes yeah. through all the, you know, box breathing and four, seven, eight. And, you know, we went through all the different types of breathing. He works you through all that. And man, my hands were just shaking. It's incredible.
just a side note before we jump back into some of the 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 uh, technical stuff with biohack and had a couple of questions on is um, I am completely drawn to Austin for so many reasons. So many people that like I love their work and follow and I have some friends that are out there. So um, when are you planning on moving? Are you going to be in Austin for a few months? Uh, yeah, I live in Dallas, but I'm in, I'm in Austin probably like every other week. We need to connect when I come down there. Cause I'm making a trip down there to see some people and uh, go out and just kind of maybe go to kill Tony, go watch Tony Hinchcliffe do his thing for uh, comedy and, you know, get out there down to on it and all these different places. But man, I'm excited to come to Austin. So I'll make sure to plug into you while I'm down there, man. A hundred percent. Um, so going back to kind of more of the biohacking theme, um, there's two topics that I wanted to kind of address and, and, and they're selfish. It's sex and it's alcohol. And, and, and I want to talk about, um, you know, I'm 39 years old and I'm coming into a season where they tell me that, you know, biologically my testosterone is going down every year and things can be affected with libido, but then there's different cultures. Like I grew up Italian and there's, you know, very romantic kind of sexual culture. You see these like horn balls that are like 70, 80 year old dudes that just like never really seem to lose their libido. I'm sure there's different, a sliding scale of like where that might be in terms of like maybe strength over erection or all these different things. But um, when it comes to biohacking and I kind of have some ideas, but just teach me like I'm someone who's never heard about this before, like with, with biohacking and things that you could do holistically, what are some things a man can do to make sure they're staying on top of their game in the bedroom? Okay. A few things there. Like um, one of the big, biggest things I would talk about is, is insulin resistance there. Like when we're insulin resistant, um, when we're essentially type two diabetic or borderline diabetic, we're not going to get as good of erections when we're masturbating often to porn uh, that leads into that kind of dopaminergic circle. That's, that's not necessarily healthy. Like, um, it can be an addictive dark hole that you can get into essentially sure. that's going to hurt your ability to have a stronger libido for your partner. Also nitric oxide. Um, you know, that's really important. So, um, I, going back to I sleep Yes, and you get less than some studies say seven hours, some studies say six and a half, you get in an acute insulin resistant state and you will not have enough cellular energy you will have higher insulin levels and you'll essentially be acutely diabetic now if you do this chronically especially if you have apnea that's really bad mm. uh, then you'll be diabetic and then you'll have uh, five times the rate of diabetes and three times the rate of coronary heart disease higher rates of cancer alzheimer's parkinson's etc from not wow. getting enough sleep wow and and going back to the psychological aspect that's so important is, you know, choosing love, like you're saying, like wanting and desiring. And that's where like porn can be a dark circle as well, like I was talking about. So yeah, I would, I would reduce, uh, you know, porn viewing, I would uh, have things that are higher nitrate foods, uh, fermented foods going back to gut health and the brain. So, you know, fermented foods would be sauerkraut, um, you know, pickles and things like that, things that have vinegar, um, kombucha, um, you know, uh, yogurt, things like that, having the, the high nitrate foods, which would be things like beets and kale and celery and rutabaga and so, some of those kinds of things. Uh, and then I would take something like berberine. Uh, I've patented a form dihydroberberine that's five times more bioavailable and lasts twice as long in the plasma. Um, but that's a glucose disposal agent that's going to help with your insulin sensitivity and metabolic dysfunction. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, I would say um, the more you use it, you know, the, the better, like, so like just being sexually active and, and it, again, it's not, it's not porn. It's like, it's literally being sexually active and being intimate. And, and what we talked about before, like seeing and being seen, Yes. having foreplay, making it exciting, dressing up costumes, go to different places. Sometimes like people, um, the stress of just being at home makes it not fun. So just I mean, renting a hotel for the yeah. night in town can like take away that stress, you know, make moments 
uh, to allow for, you know, lovemaking and sex. And of course, just being as healthy as possible, going back to allostatic load and being anti-fragile, you know, like doing the cold plunges, doing the red light, doing the, the workouts at the gym, doing intermittent fasting, you will be more resilient. You'll be more able to physically do that. But a lot of times there was like an old test, like where you could put like a, a row of stamps, like on your penis at night. And you would see, cause we're supposed to get like, you know, an erection, like every 45 minutes or something like that through the night, you would see if like the stamps separated that you were getting erections through the night. A lot of people that think they have erectile dysfunction don't. It's more a case of the, the psychological yes. will yes. or thrill um to have sex so that's just something to think about it's not just using pde5 inhibitors and and then you're good to go it's it's something to explore more is your desire around sex and and to your point like with some of these european countries and you know it's a it's a different culture and i think a lot of people have libido issues here in this culture because you know they're attracted to because of porn, you know, 18 to 24 year old, you know, perfect body women and, and they don't understand the idea of intimacy and sex and what it is throughout the lifetime uh, of your, of your uh, stay here on earth. So I, I think that's, that's, that's what I would say. Um, as far as alcohol, um, I think the data is pretty good at two drinks per day, actually still being healthy. Some data says as high as four drinks. Here, here's the thing where there's a massive amount of variance going back to blue zones, slower culture, having more intimacy and love, desire for sex. Those are those European places. Those are those blue zones. Those are it's very different from the pace we're keeping, the stress we're keeping, the yes. diet we're eating, right? And so alcohol can serve as a stress trigger if you're only using alcohol when you're stressed out, right? That's like in NLP, they talk about like these physiologic anchors. Yes. So whenever you're using alcohol for stress, whenever you have alcohol, your body thinks it's stressed. In these other cultures, they're in a parasympathetic state. They're very relaxed. They're having like this amazing meal and they're sipping it over the course of three hours. You think that's different than pounding it when you're stressed out to like loud music in a club or a bar? <laughs> it's massively different. Right. So like to just say, oh, two drinks, three drinks, what? It's not the same, like it, you can't tease that out. Like it's it, the culturally it's so different. And that's why I think the data looks different when you look at these blue zone cultures where they do have alcohol. But by and large, there's a threshold where to a certain point, uh, it improves um, the endothelial um, elasticity, like the vasodilation. And obviously at a certain point, kind of like that bell curve I talked about before, there's, there's a downside to the bell curve. Yep. And I would say that, you know, maybe like the, the two drinks that aren't sugary, that are sipped, that are realistic portions um, had with a meal, had in a, in a positive environment, could be use stresses. Certainly one drink, is, it could be a use stress. Now there does come a point where it becomes a distress and it becomes a toxin. And, you know, especially if you're having some of these dirtier liquors, if you will, or, you know, something like that, like you know, with a wine, I would like to have a dry farms wine with a, with a liquor. I'm going to have like a, a clean vodka or tequila or, you know, gin or something. One of the, one of the clear liquors, um, you know, with beer, you know, it's a, same idea, like, you know, get organic, get a, whatever it is, like try and, you know, have it as clean a source as possible. Yep. Um, and that's obviously going to matter. So that's what I think. I love it. I love it. One last question before, before we jump off. Have you had any experience with doing any microdosing protocols with uh, psilocybin? Yes. And I love it. Um, I do uh, 100 milligrams uh, twice a week. That's it. Uh, it's not 
Paul Stamets protocol. I was just thinking the Stamets protocol, the four days on, three days off with 0.2 yep. a day, and then uh, stacking with Lions, because that's what I'm about to do. So I'm actually about to jump into a microdosing protocol. So any advice for this psycho? Yeah, yeah. I like staying on a, like a little bit longer uh, with the, the 100 milligrams, um, two to three times a week. Um, you know, I'm more, I've experimented and talked with a lot of people on this and minimum effective dose like yeah. it still works great you know um you don't need to have uh almost bordering into like mini dose territory where it's perceptual like the dose i'm using is sub perceptual but uh, what i do notice is that within a week or two anxiety shifts dramatically wow and i just feel more productive i feel more centered i feel more zen um, just getting more work done stuff isn't bothering me on the same level it used to someone yes. you know gets in my face i'm like oh it's their problem you know it's it's yeah. that kind of thing and and it just feels great um i do like the the lion's mane and niacin i have a much 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 more complicated protocol of course uh, that enhances <laughs> bdnf and and neuroplasticity and and also um it, fascinating like lion's mane is like one level but i'll give you one yeah, tell me about your protocol. That's, uh, that's um, 7 8 dihydroxyflavone. This stuff orally is actually more, impo- uh, more potent than injecting BDNF, the protein itself that enhances neuroplasticity. Wow. So, and it smokes lion's mane. So, I would use this over that. I do like niacin going as high dose as you can if you can deal with the flush the and flush. tingling. It's called peristesis. Um, it's uncomfortable at first, so you can work your way up. What I would do is get 100 milligram caps and work your way up to 500 milligrams. And then you can just buy 500 milligrams caps. But it takes some adjustment to get used to it. Sure. Um, and then I would do at least... 500 milligrams twice a day when you can build up. Now this is for life. Fascinating thing about niacin is, you know, we talk about NMN and NR and some of these things that boost NAD. We didn't even get into this discussion, but it's a whole up, niacin, round two. We'll go back for round two. <laughs> niacin is better than anything I've ever seen at increasing NAD. It's a precursor to NAD. Wow. There was one study with healthy males that it increased eight times the level in muscle just by taking niacin 500 milligrams twice a day. So that's, if you can build up to that. And then there's also some data that it gets a little complicated to explain here very quickly, but essentially it could be one of the most potent fat loss compounds. And the reason no one knows about it or does it is because of the flushing issue. Sure. It's but it, it's, yeah, yeah. So it's something to explore. Um, and then, Another compound that I find really fascinating going back to alcohol and some plant medicine journeys is something called dihydromyrcetin. It's really potent as an antitoxin, um, really preventing hangovers. So there's nothing better out there than this compound. So that's built into my protocol as well. So much that I have for the next conversation, brother, but this has been powerful. Um, I have so much love for you and your vulnerability and telling your journey and your story because I think there's so many people that have experienced similar things. Like I said, like we hadn't even talked, but we had 20 things in common already. And we're just scratching the surface. So I'm excited to see more of your work and excited to see what you do in the world, brother. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me on, Jesse. 